Okay. Right. Let's give uh, let's give everyone else another uh, sixty seconds, and then uh, uh, and then we'll start off. Um. Maybe if um, if anyone has, uh, I don't know, if you could put it maybe in the in the chat window, um, what your if you're running this on your computer, or if you've downloaded one of the VMs, or if you're just plan planning to follow along, um, that would be great just to give me an idea for how uh, how people are doing this, um, and uh, also maybe if you are using your own computer, how much RAM you have. Um, there is uh, an option for 16 gigabytes and an option for 32. But we'll get to that. Right, so um, the time, 60, 60 seconds is up. So let's begin. Uh, so my name is James. Uh, my day job is an electrical engineer at CERN. And uh, I do crazy things with computers and electronics in my spare time. And one of those things is organizing this workshop. Uh, so our topic for today is getting started with uh, AI. And the idea is that it will be kind of a 0 to 60 uh, for people who've never done, never run AI um, programs themselves on their own computer or kind of uh, followed along with it. Um, you'll also get a chance to uh, play with some of the tools and uh, to test out uh, text generation with an LLM, a large language model, and image generation um, with a diffusion model. Uh, so let's begin. There we go. So we'll talk about AI very generally. Um, some of the core concepts are like transformers. Uh, we'll look at uh, the hardware that you need, um, which uh, hopefully, surprisingly, is actually very low to start doing uh, inference, uh, which is what we'll be doing today. We'll look at some of the software uh, that's involved, so the, the kind of the stack, uh, Linux, um, Python uh, libraries, uh, platforms, um, some of the models uh, that you can run, how you can adapt AI to actually suit your personal uh, needs and requirements with uh, customization and uh, training. And interspersed with this, we'll have two exercises. So open source text generation using an LLM and open source image generation using um, a diffusion model. We should take more than uh, an hour and a half um, uh, again, if you want, if you have questions, um, uh, throw them in the chat, um, or feel free just to um, unmute yourself and start uh, talking. Um, and um, there's also some notes that I prepared. So if you go to um, uh, gists.github.com um, slash pingu98, uh, then you can, um, in fact, let me paste that into the chat uh, because there's actually a, whoops. There you go. If you want to um, open that um, in a separate tab, you can uh, see some more of the, the notes. Uh, so two changes to uh, the advertised program. We won't be using SSH, so uh, I hope you didn't um, spend too long installing an SSH client. Um, I'll share with you a web address, uh, which will be active at certain points during uh, the session, where you can just put in your browser and actually play with the tool. And I'll show you on my screen uh, what's going on at the back end. And to use the model that we're using for the LLM, you will need 32 gigs of RAM because it uses about 28, 29. Uh, there is another one which we'll talk about. There's a reference in the uh, GIST notes, which you can get away with if you have a 16 gig. It uses, I think, about nine. Um, so there we go, let's begin. I'm not gonna run through the slides and then do the demos. We're gonna kind of swap between the two. Um, you will see why uh, as we go. Basically, it's to give the demos a chance to run in the background so you can use the demos whilst we're talking. Um, they're not the fastest in the world. So let's uh, begin with our first demo. Uh, so a large language model, uh, this is uh, kind of uh, similar to chat GPT, uh, general purpose transformer, um, or general purpose pre-trained transformer. 
and um, I will share my screen and we'll run through the steps. We'll do a couple of different stages. So I'll run it in the terminal um, and then I will load the, the web front end so that you guys can then access it. Um, so the web uh, address is down in the bottom. I'll paste it into the chat when it's up and running. And if I could ask you, we'll do some kind of roll call system for you to use it. Unfortunately, there is no queue. So all the info, all the requests just come in at once to the server um, and it gets a little bit overwhelmed. So if, if we can maybe figure out a way of taking turns uh, so that everyone has a go um, in sequence, then that'll keep the load down the server down. Um, the second demo that we'll do has a queuing mechanism built in. So everyone can just uh, have a go uh, straight away and you'll all get uh, served in, uh, in the order of which you submitted. So let's um, put this to one side. Um, we'll start with uh, the uh, Vicuna uh, 7 billion parameter LLM. Uh, so here, this is my VM, um, uh, and I'm going to open it up. So I'm going to log in. Um, and this is a standard uh, Ubuntu uh, terminal. Uh, everyone can see uh, my terminal screen, yes? Yes. Great. Um, so let's kind of pop that over here. And if we go down to... Um, this so um, we'll do. I, I've already installed all this stuff, but I'll run through the commands anyway. Um, so that um, so this is the standard um, Linux command for updating the local software packages you have installed on your computer. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar, um, and now we're going to do uh, the same thing. So uh, sudo is uh, super user privileges to make system changes. And then apt-get is the package manager. Um, okay. uh, so I already have these things installed. Um, if you're running this on a new system, it will um, pull down um, Git, which is a um, software repo management system. Uh, and um, sorry, just my light a little. There we go. That's, that's better. Yeah. That's perfect. Uh, right. Um, so yes, Git is a package or is a is a code management system, um, which you can use to access GitHub. Um, we'll then upgrade pip. Um, so pip is um, a Python again package management system. Um, we'll be using Python three for everything. Python three is the default um, now in the current version of Ubuntu twenty two point zero four. Three. Okay. Ah, yeah. So your mileage may vary with the uh what we'll do is this. Um there we go. So it's already installed. Um if you have a fresh installation, this will now install an upgrade pip. Uh, now onto the more uh, exciting stuff. So we're going to clone the fast chat uh, GitHub repo. Um, so I'm just going to um, open this in uh, our browser so you can see. Um, so this is a framework which uh, runs a large language model um, and will run uh, in Python uh, on Linux and provides you with both a command uh, prompt interface terminal, um, and also uh, there's a web extension for it, so you can, can share it. Um, I have already uh, downloaded it. Um, if not, you can clone it. Um, it will come into a directory called FastChant, so uh, capital F, capital C. Uh, Linux, for those of you who are new to it, is case sensitive. And here we are. Uh, so now I'm just going to run um, a very simple uh, command line instance. So this will run locally in this terminal, and I'm the only one who can uh, send stuff to it. Um, so let's 
serve CY model path. So this is capable of running multiple models. Um, we're going to run the Vicuna uh, 7 billion parameter. Uh, if you have a smaller uh, amount of RAM available, uh, then there's another model you can use called the fast chat, um, which we'll look at um, maybe whilst this one is cranking away. Um, LM Sys, so they're the company that make it. B, and it's uh, version 1.5 CPU. And we will run it on our CPU. So there we go. Right. Now, again, I've also already downloaded uh, the model. Uh, so the model is uh, local, and it's now loading it into RAM. Uh, in parallel with this, so now I'm going to do um, uh, control uh, right, which opens up a new uh, session in my terminal client. Um, and I'm going to log in again. Uh, and here I'm going to run HTOP. Uh, so HTOP is a system performance kind of management tool. It shows you what the computer is doing. So we can see up on the very top um, the uh, 20 uh, virtual CPUs, which this machine has been allocated. Uh, and then we can also see the mem, uh, so memory bar. We have 25.8 gigabytes of the 30 gigabytes at full. Uh, that's because we've loaded the model. And if we skip back to our other window, uh, we can see, I just give us some warnings, but right down at the bottom, we have a user prompt um, where we can actually enter something and get this model to uh, start working. So I prepared some sample questions. Uh, uh, what is the relationship like between Vladimir Putin and Joe Biden? Uh, let's ask it and see what it says. Um, Push the button, and now it's thinking. Uh, so we can skip over to our other window, and we can see here that um, basically all of our cores, uh, all 20 of them, are completely lit up. Uh, the CPU is working very hard. Um, this machine doesn't have a GPU. So this is one of the main things I want to demonstrate to you today, that we can run uh, inference work uh, with an AI model without needing uh, to have a fancy GPU. Um, it's not the fastest in the world. This is a fairly old uh, Xeon computer, um, but it's the kind of thing that you could rent um, very economically as a, a private server from a cloud provider. Um, and uh, it's also not too far away from what you could have on your desktop if you have a, a higher performance PC. So you can see it's uh, maxed out right now. And if we go back to our main window, um, here we have Vladimir Putin is the president of the Federation. Joe Biden is president of the They have a formal relationship. It's heads of state. Um, so this is um, what the model has generated, uh, and it's now finished. Um, so that was what it told us about their relationship. Uh, and if we go back, we can see now that our CPU cores are all back down to zero. Um, but our memory is still at 25 gig. That's because we still have the model loaded into memory, um, and there's another prompt. Um, so let's uh, let's ask it uh, who will win the 2024 US election, um, and it should give us a nice uh, chat GPT like answer. So you'll see there's there's a fair delay before it actually starts spitting stuff back to us, um, and we're going to talk about some of the um, intricacies of kind of how the model is and why the model is um, like that and why it doesn't give you an instant response. You'll find if you've used ChatGPT or other online AI services that there is a bit of an input delay. Um, part of this is because the input that we write in has to be encoded before it can actually start to do anything. So as an AI language model, I am not able to predict the future, um, including the outcome of future elections. Uh, again, this is a, a nice bit of programming. So the Vicuna model is fully open source. Um, which isn't the case for all of them. You've probably heard of Llama, um, which is the meta uh, Facebook model, uh, which they claim to be open source, but the openness of the license varies a lot on what you're actually uh, trying to, to use it for. Uh, so there we go. It's difficult to accurately forecast who will win. Uh, very nice. Um, now let's do something a little more exciting. Um, so uh, please, I think we'll skip the, um, the address in the style of Donald Trump, and maybe we'll skip directly to Shakespeare. Um, right, a weather report. 
uh, it's sunny day in the style of William Shakespeare. So this is drawing on the 7 billion uh, parameters, which come from uh, training sources. Um, I haven't actually looked into what they trained this on, but there are uh, several large open source data sets which tend to go into most models, and then they add extra pieces. Um, so here it's going to write us a nice um, sonnet. You can see that it also does the punctuation with the lines and uh, new lines. And there we go. And in parallel, we'll see, you, know, you can see here it's, it's wearing away. And we've uh, basically got all of these uh, workers each running on one core of our CPU, um, all together generating um, this text. You'll also see that there's a variation in the length of the responses that it gives. Uh, so that's a parameter we can actually tune. And when we start running this in the web um, interface, uh, you'll be able to tell it how many tokens you want to return. Uh, and the so a token is uh, a number of characters. So it could be a word, it's a short word, um, it could be three or four characters. And it's kind of the, effectively the reasoning language uh, of the AI systems um, today. And this is common across the kind of all the model classes that we'll be looking at today, um, uh, transformers and diffusion models for the input where you are effectively parsing text um, and turning it into uh, a matrix, which you can then uh, operate on. So it's writing has written us a very nice little um, sonnet there. To wrap this kind of non-interactive demo up, I'm going to ask it, um, what is five times 10? Just to show that these models can not only do uh, text-based reasoning, but also a little bit of logic and a little bit of calculation. Um, I have to say, when I tested this uh, the first time around, uh, it got this question wrong. Um, I've tested it a few times since, and every time it's come out right, um, we will see um, very soon uh, whether it's uh, getting it correct. It's important to remember that this model is not uh, deterministic. There are you know, random variables in here so you cannot rely on it to always uh, return uh, the right answer, but today it's having a good day. Um, this is maybe the, the most jarring element of using uh, these large AI models that uh, sometimes they give you the wrong answer and sometimes they give you the right answer. Um, and knowing the difference is uh, not always easy. So there we go. So that um, is a very um, simple demo of you know, some things you can ask it to do. If you're running this um, locally and you have less than 32 gig of RAM, you can use this fast chat um, model, uh, which is very similar, uh, but has fewer parameters, uh, 3 billion. And so that will run um, much more happily in 9 gig of RAM, give or take. Uh, what I'm now going to do is to um, run this up as a web server. So we'll have exactly the same model that I've just been using um, exposed uh, to the web, where you can all connect to it. Um, so we do this with three parts. Um, so first of all, let's quit this instance. And we're going to do um, python 3 m fast chat serve controller. Okay, and this will now run um, a control process. We're going to skip to our next window. Um, and we're going to do um, 3 m Fast chat serve model worker. And this will spawn a worker process, which, um, oh, OK. I forgot to tell it to just use the CPU. So uh, let's see what we need to do that. Uh, we need to say device CPU. 
So as you saw, it wanted an NVIDIA driver. It wanted an NVIDIA GPU. Um, now it's uh, happily loading stuff into RAM. Uh, the default presumption is that you're going to have a GPU, but you don't actually need one. And now we're going to log in uh, yet again. And this time around, we are going to, um, first of all, we can test it. Um, And so this will, um, yeah, do message passing. So tell me a story with more than a thousand words. Um, and now it's starting to uh, tell us a story. So we know that that is working. Uh, so we'll do the same thing um, and we'll run it into the web server. So this will now um, spool up a web server, uh, which is bound to 0, .0, 0 0.0.0 on my local machine. Uh, and I've exposed that port. Uh, so if you go in your browser, I'll do it here, and then I'll paste it into the chat to uh, divinemaster.com uh, slash 7860. You should see this. So let's pop that in the chat. Now, um, this is open for everyone. Um, and let's uh, have a system for who goes when uh, so that not everyone puts everything straight in uh, because uh, we'll open another window. Um, and monitor our CPU load. Um, so uh, Stephanie, would you like to go first since you're in the top left-hand corner? of my window. Um, feel free to type in a prompt. Um, doesn't really matter what it is. And press Enter. Um, and you should, um, we should see the CPU uh, light up uh, as it starts to process your, uh, your request. Maybe uh, uh, Stasa, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. You can also go at the same time. There we go. So you can see that it's now received a request and um, the threads are running at about 70, 80% and it's done. Um, if we look in our other windows, um, we can see um, what happened. There we go. Some user asked, what's the temperature? And it's working away on the answer. So whoever that was, you should see it. Um, so now maybe um, uh, Milo and Kevin, um, if you want to go uh, next. Um, think of uh, what you want to to, to put in. And the rest of you, if you want to queue up um, something in, in your box, um, I will, there you go. So uh, Milo and Kevin, you can go now. Um, we can, um, we can see how that uh, goes. Um, let me go back to my slides. Um, and in the meantime, we can pick up on this. So what we have here is effectively, um, a mini version of ChatGPT, and it's all running on a computer um, in the basement of my house. Uh, and you guys are, there we go. Now you can see um, that we have quite a lot of threads, yeah, all kind of lots of processes all running. The screen is completely full. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, this load average um, shows the 
demand on the server versus what it can actually deal with. So we have 20 cores. So when this goes above 20, um, we are uh, beyond saturation. You can also see that it's dealing with all of the queries simultaneously. And you may notice that your query gets answered slower. Um, we should be able to put a fair amount of, of load on um, here without uh, any problems. Let's, uh, let's carry on with the slides. So there we go, that's our uh, large language model. To switch over from practice to theory, so the theory of what we're talking about today uh, rests on kind of three main pillars. Um, the first one is neural networks, um, and the seminal paper on this is called A Logical Calculus of the Ideas of uh, Imminent in, uh, of the Ideas Imminent in Nervous Activity. Uh, and it's actually from uh, 1940. Three, uh, so it's it's very old. Um, I'll give you a very very um, brief explanation of what a neural network is for those of you who haven't come across them again. Um, so that is kind of a fundamental piece of uh, AI as we know it today. Um, the other two, um, so for transformer models, so like the one that we're using right now, um, the seminal paper is called "Attention is All You Need," um, and this is where they came up with the idea of adding. Uh, attention kind of focus to uh, a neural network and to uh, a model of uh, words as tokens for uh, what was language prediction. Um, and that basically has unlocked um, the capabilities that you guys are now uh, playing with. And then the final one is a deep unsupervised learning using non-equilibrium thermodynamics, uh, which you wouldn't think necessarily had that much to do with uh, drawing pictures using computers, but this is the paper which underlies uh, what we use today uh, in diffusion models for AI uh, generative art um, and the ones we'll be playing with later on. Okay, so this is still um, ticking away. Um, we'll wait for it to go down a bit before uh, Daniel and uh, Gianluigi, you can have a go. Oh yeah, I missed out. So the other thing that makes all this go is lots and lots of vector multiplication. Uh, just as a very brief uh, reminder, um, or maybe uh, introduction, if you haven't come across vectors in the past, I don't know what you all do um, in your various walks of life. So here are vectors, and there are two ways of multiplying vectors together. A dot product, um, which you can see here, A dot B, where we multiply A1 by B1, A2 by B2, A3 by B3. Um, it's fairly simple. Um, that's not the one we're going to be mostly using. Under the hood, um, a lot of what is going on here are cross products. So um, vector C is equal to the cross product of vector A and vector B. And so here what we're doing is we're expanding this into three dimensions and um, multiplying um, all the different sides by each other and then uh, making the difference. Um, as you can see, there's, there's a lot more steps involved in this. It's quite a complex process. We won't talk you know, about the details of it. Um, this is the mechanism um, by which uh, the LLM that we're using effectively arrives at the words that it's going to spit out, um, the kind of the mathematical process. And it's complex. Um, the reason why everyone uses GPUs uh, for this is because GPUs have special uh, silicon, which is great for doing this kind of vector multiplication, because it just happens that that's also good for computer games uh, and videos. You can do the same thing on a CPU, which we're doing. Um, it's slower, but it's a lot cheaper. Um, so there we go. So that's that's uh, a very, very brief overview of um, the, the mathematical uh, background. Now on to uh, neural networks. Um, so for me, kind of the not entirely correct uh, metaphor that I like to use for neural networks is that it's like a football team and they pass the ball and eventually it gets to the front line and then somebody scores. Um, the uh, let's uh, uh, maybe uh, Daniel and Gianluigi, if you haven't gone already, uh, feel free to go. Um, the server can can handle some more, I think. So, uh, what do we have here? Um, we have input, uh, which goes to layers of nodes, and each node has a weighting and has connections for inputs and outputs. Uh, we have a depth, so this is depth of one. But um, we could have a very uh, deep 
uh, neural network. And this is a feed forward network. So, you know, what goes in at the top comes out at the bottom. Um, fundamentally, we put in numbers, we get numbers out. It's not what you see here where we put in text and we get text out. Um, this is the uh, the engine, if you will, of the car. It's uh, not the complete car. And neural networks uh, like this can be trained. Um, so we can use what's called a cost function and some training data uh, to adjust the weights of these nodes. And this process is analogous to the functioning of neurons uh, in the brain. Um, but obviously, it's done in, in silicon. Uh, I believe it's Intel just made the largest neuromorphic computer yet. Um, and basically, they are uh, building this functionality uh, on chips. So this is a feed-forward network. There are two other main types of networks. Uh, one is called a convolutional uh, neural network. So that is geared towards uh, multiplication of things um, and is uh, specifically used for image recognition. Uh, you might have heard from you know, maybe uh, five, 10 years ago, um, uh, militaries were already using neural networks <clears throat> for image recognition to get data out of um, spy satellites and you know, find tanks, et cetera. Uh, right, the, the server load has gone down again. Um, so Eva and uh, Benjamin, if you want to um, uh, have a go, it's your, your turn. Um, so there we go. That's a, a very uh, brief uh, summary. Recurrent neural networks um, are more focused on time series data. So things like um, weather forecast predicting um, where you have a time series in and you want to predict uh, the next uh, number in the sequence. Um, I'm going to uh, run this as a, as a slideshow because there's some animations here that might help to um, explain. So transformers. So this is what we're using right now. Uh, GPT, as you've heard of from ChatGPT from OpenAI, kind of the flagship of um, AI products uh, right now, stands for Generative Pre-trained transformer. So we're using a transformer process. Um, and I want you to kind of think about this in terms of transformers for translation. So you know, if we want to translate English to French, um, we could just look up each word and do a find and replace. But really, that's that's not how translation works. That's very rudimentary. Uh, actually, we're looking for patterns, and we want to exchange patterns in English for patterns in French. Um, so it's not just a lookup table. It is more sophisticated. And it uh, depends upon uh, the structure of the sentence, how we should translate it. So here, I mean, we've gone from number in, number out to text stream in, text stream out. Uh, there's our input and our output. Uh, the first part is called an encoder. So I mentioned this very briefly um, when we first started. The reason why there's a delay is because the input that you write in has to be encoded. Uh, and it's encoded into uh, what we call tokens. So this is a grouping of characters. Um, effectively a, a piece of matrix, which can then be used for the matrix multiplications. What is interesting about um, uh, GPT models is they have a number of layers. Um, and then we have a decoder. So the decoder will convert tokens uh, back to uh, text characters. Um, GPT-3 is what's called an autoregressive model. So this is the third GPT model made by OpenAI. Uh, and what this means is that there is feedback. So it's not a straight pass through from uh, input uh, to uh, output. Um, there is kind of feedback and, and loops within it. We won't go into the gory detail. Um, and there is this uh, attention function. So when we feed in our tokens, we are also assigning um, effectively weights to it for attention. What is the most important part of the sentence? Um, and that is how the kind of the magic happens with uh, it seeming like it is um, intelligent and giving you a reasonable answer uh, when really it's just a, a bunch of vector maths um, and some neural networks. And the layers in this uh, GPT run in parallel. Um, and that ties in with you know, the fact that we're using uh, 20 CPU cores and it splits up uh, relatively easily and scales to the number of cores we give it is because of these layers. Um, so there is a good scaling and parallelism uh, works very well with GPT models. That's how we can get uh, 80 billion plus parameter models uh, with hardware that we have today. You can just uh, block uh, copy 
stuff. Um, that's what NVIDIA do with their, for example, the H100. They have, you know, they sell you, you don't just buy one, you buy a data center full of them. The other things to note about uh, GPT models is that they, you can effectively bulk train them in an unsupervised way. Um, so for example, um, text models, as I mentioned, there's there are data sets out there of open source information like um, books which are out of copyright, um, which are just fed in wholesale um, by people like uh, OpenAI into their models um, to construct the first kind of draft, if you will. Um, and then they follow up with what's called supervised training. So supervised training is where we not only have you know, unstructured uh, data, but well, it, it's structured data, but it's not sorted. We actually kind of give it a query and response. And we say, you know, if, if the input was, um, uh, how are you feeling today? The output should be, uh, I'm feeling very well, thank you, but I'm a computer model, so I don't really have feelings. And using that kind of um, input-output pairing so that you can actually uh, further train your model to uh, get the results that we see rather than just uh, parrot repetitions of bits of a book. If you give it a little bit, it'll give you a bit more. Uh, some models do still uh, feature that. So that um, is a very brief, um, missing many points, but hopefully the essential is there. An introduction to a GPT model. Uh, let's see how we're doing uh, service free again. So um, uh, Eva and uh, Benjamin, if you haven't been, and uh, uh, Evangelia and Ariel, you can probably go uh, too as well. Um, and uh, thanks for your patience, Emily. You can go uh, next. Let's go back to the slideshow. So this is Transformers. And now diffusion models, um, because that's really what this is all about, is uh, cute pictures of virtual puppies that don't actually exist. So the basis for computer image generation today is non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Um, and that is kind of weird, but um, it's basically taking uh, a non-equilibrium state and reversing it using a neural network. So if we take an image um, like a puppy um, and we add some random noise uh, progressively, um, we then use a neural network to say, um, please fix this noise. So please take me back to the original image. Um, that is effectively what our diffusion models are doing. So we're training neural networks saying, here are two images. Here's the puppy, and here's the puppy with some noise. And um, train yourself to convert the puppy with the noise back to the regular puppy. Um, and we can keep adding different amounts of noise. Uh, the noise um, is oops, um, Gaussian noise. So uh, for those of you familiar with statistics, it's a kind of the, the basic noise that you have um, in uh, the real world. And um, from this um, mess, you can generate a puppy. Uh, that's not all there is to it, right? Because people don't feed in random noise um, into um, the image generators, as, as you will see when we get to using them. Um, people feed in prompts. Um, so the kind of this is the first layer of understanding. The second layer of understanding, um, uh, this runs on a convolutional uh, neural network. It's very similar to the neural network we looked at before. Um, is this thing called latent space. And I'm not going to go into detail on what latent space is. Um, there is a link to a YouTube video that explains it far better than, than I ever could. Uh, fundamentally, um, if we think of this noise um, as and the, the neural network that we use to process this noise and to, to generate our puppy, if we chopped off the bottom node of it that kind of gives us the answer, and so we kind of have the pre-processed but not finalized neural network information, um, let's say in, in three dimensions, um, that would be effectively a phase space. So we would have, you know, if we did all the different puppies, they would be kind of clustered in one area of neural networks that reconstruct puppies. Uh, let's say we have horses as well. So another area would be clustered with horses. So the, uh, the kind of the, the second piece of magic in making images from uh, diffusion models is that we tie prompts, which we process as tokens in the same way that we did for the transform model, 
um, to areas of the phase split, the latent space, the phase space and behind this randomness. And that enables us to have a model where you can say, uh, please draw me a puppy and it will draw you a puppy and please draw me a robot and it will draw me a robot. Because uh, when you look in the latent space, there is clustering of things that look like puppies look like puppies and things that look like robots look like robots and things that look like horses look like horses. And of course, sometimes these models get things wrong because these uh, phase spaces on the latent space is not completely separated. You know, there is some overlap between robots and dogs and that's what confuses them. Um, Let's see how our CPU is doing. Right, the CPU is, is free, so uh, normally it's uh, it's all yours. And if anybody else wants to have a second go, um, please um, feel free. I will leave it running um, until we're um, ready to start our uh, next exercise. So this, I would say, if anyone has any questions um, at any point, feel free to um, put them in the chat or just to unmute and um, mention that. So I'm um, going to give you a very brief summarized version of kind of the basic architecture of um, an AI model today. So we start off with text, our input data, which people call a prompt. Um, and we have a dictionary. So each model has its own dictionary. And this basically uh, takes groups of letters and converts them into uh, a matrix with a particular value. And that's kind of the, the first stage of the process. That's why it takes a little bit of time to warm up and you don't just get outputs straight away. This makes tokens. So the tokens are the currency that our model will operate on. Um, we build up all our tokens together. You can think of it like an input matrix. So your, your query that you put in your prompt is effectively a matrix uh, of these tokens. Um, and we take the training data, um, effectively the, the trained model um, would be a better um, term. And we do a large amount of uh, vector multiplication on them. Um, okay, so checkpoint model is another term for like, a trained model. And then from this, um, we put it into a transformer um, architecture. We get out text. And if we're using a diffusion model architecture, uh, we get out an image. This is an image that one of my friends generated using the thing that we're going to be using uh, right now. And of course, um, don't forget that there is feedback so there is a, a feedback loop in both diffusion models and also transformers, um, which is how they kind of get to be uh, quite as impressive uh, as they are right now. So that's the software side of things. Um, let's, um, has everyone had a play with, okay, the LLM is still running. So let's, um, let's carry on a bit more. Um, so hardware. So I mentioned that this is running on a computer down in my basement. Um, and it's uh, an old Xeon uh, CPU from, I don't know, uh, 2016, uh, basically a, a decade old almost, uh, with 32 gigabytes of RAM, um, a cooler on it, a nice big cooler. Um, there's an NVMe drive in there, but it's nothing special. A power supply, it's about 800 watts because it's a, an old, inefficient CPU. Uh, it's in a case. Uh, I have a graphics card, but it's not a fancy GPU. It cost me 30 euros. So um, I paid 150 for the board. It's a little bit more these days. Uh, and the chip uh, and the RAM. Um, secondhand, it's all old server stuff that's been decommissioned. Um, the total uh, setup cost me uh, 330 um, bucks, uh, Swiss francs, euros. Um, they're pretty equivalent these days. Um, and that's running all these models. And it's running all these models for all of you. So that's, uh, for me, I'm, I'm very impressed with that. Um, you can do it on your desktop if you have enough RAM. Um, you don't need a, a GPU to do this. Um, that's not to say that you should do um, what I'm doing. In fact, it didn't even cost me this much because I had some parts left over that I recycled. If you're into computers, you can probably do the same. Um, so that's what I did, and that's what it looks like. Uh, you can see there's a, there's a hard drive in there as well. I might have put in some other stuff I had um, on the shelf. It's just a regular. Um, slightly powerful desktop computer. Um, if you want to build your own uh, generative AI PC, um, you probably shouldn't do what I did. Um, you can also rent one. Um, so you know, if you just want to do play around with it for a couple of days, you don't need to spend hundreds. You can just spend uh, a little bit of money with someone like Amazon to rent an instance uh, where you can play with it and then turn it off and you don't need to store it. A good CPU is important, even if you're using a GPU, 
and uh, there is a set of instructions called AVX 512. So these are 512-bit uh, matrix vector multiplication instructions um, for the CPU. And they're ideal for doing this kind of stuff and make CPU-based inference go a lot quicker. Uh, the problem is that they only uh, are implemented in the latest uh, Xeon and Epic uh, chips from AMD and Intel. So the Xeon that I have downstairs doesn't have these instructions. Um, the cost of a chip, last time I looked uh, with this, just the CPU is about 4,000, um, which is expensive. Uh, you will need a lot of RAM, um, I would say at least 32 gig. Um, and a GPU is the way that most people do this. Um, it would probably be 10x faster uh, than our demo today. Um, the key thing with the GPU is uh, lots of RAM. As you can see, we're using uh, basically 30 gig uh, just for the model. Um, so the more VRAM you have on your GPU, uh, the better it will be. Uh, two uh, consumer cards that you can buy today um, on the cheaper end, um, RDX uh, 3060. So they're all NVIDIA cards. You can run this stuff on AMD um, using their equivalent of CUDA called uh, Rock M. Um, in practice, uh, everyone who's making new stuff and putting it on GitHub is using uh, CUDA and NVIDIA hardware. So um, that's um, probably the way to go uh, right now. All the way up to an RTX 4090. So this is the highest end um, consumer, prosumer um, graphics card you can buy today. And that'll cost you um, uh, just under uh, 2000. Uh, obviously, even the cheapest one is basically um, as much, if not more, than the PC that we're doing, and that's just a graphics card. You need something to put it in. Um, so GPUs are um, great, but they're also um, expensive still. Uh, let's see how our model is doing. Still running away. OK, so we'll carry on with the slides. So software. So you know, we've talked about hardware. We've talked about the models. Um, how do we actually interact with this as software? The typical AI stack, um, everyone is using Linux. Um, I haven't come across anyone who isn't. Uh, today, we're using Ubuntu. But you can use whichever uh, distribution um, you feel an affinity to. Um, and then Python. Um, pretty much all of this stuff is either in Python or is held together with Python uh, with some C. So that's sort of, I mean, that's what you've seen. You've seen us running Python commands um, in Ubuntu uh, on Linux. In terms of frameworks, so I mentioned uh, CUDA. So CUDA is a um, parallel uh, processing uh, architecture from NVIDIA, um, which they've been using, uh, pushing for, I mean, more than a decade um, for high performance computing tasks. And it's really found its niche um, with uh, AI and generative AI. Uh, JAX is another uh, framework I haven't used. Uh, TensorFlow is the one from Google, um, I believe. Transformers, so the libraries that we're using, the, the models, um, come from a place called Hugging Face, which is kind of the GitHub of AI. And they have a library called Transformers, which helps you to plug in different models to each other um, for um, doing this on your home computer. And PyTorch, um, which I, if I remember correctly, is the uh, kind of TensorFlow is the Google version, and PyTorch is the uh, Facebook now meta. Uh, framework. Um, it's kind of effectively the, the plumbing for all of this. And TensorFlow and PyTorch sit on top of CUDA. And then models. So we have effectively uh, two categories of models. We have LLMs, large language models, and diffusion models. So we use LLMs for text, and we use diffusion models for images. And kind of the new frontier is new hybrid models. People are putting multiple LLMs together under one hood with some parts that are specialized in making text and other parts that are specialized in logic. Um, you know, who knows what the next big thing uh, will be um, in AI. Um, give it a week and uh, we'll have more insight. Uh, let's see how we're doing with, there we go. So um, does anyone want to do another query on the web interface? Submit now. Otherwise, um, I will uh, close the session down. OK. No, nope, nothing's happening there. So uh, we will um, close that. Oh, yeah. So uh, the other thing is, I should have mentioned this. Everything that you ask, uh, I can see, uh, because it's the server. So um, 
but of course we don't know who asked what. Um, so now I'm just terminating all these processes. And now if we just get back to um, our HTOP, we can see that we've gone back down to 217 meg of RAM used. Um, that's just what it takes to run the four logins that we have in this HTOP program. And our CPU is zero and our load average has gone back down to 0 0.7. So we're not even using one full CPU to, to run all the stuff. OK, so that was the LLM demo. Um, and now we're going to go and do um, the demo for uh, image generation. And this one is a slightly prettier front end. Um, so you can actually all queue up stuff, and it will get to you in due time. Uh, so um, we need a few different libraries. Um, to make this uh, work. Um, so let's, I've, again, I've already installed all this, but I'll just type it in for. Um, so wget is a download program. We already have Python 3. Uh, Python 3 uh, venv, um, or uh, VNV, is for virtual environments. So we'll create like a, a virtual sub environment within our computer to run um, uh, the stable diffusion model. Um, it just means that it doesn't mess up anything else that's running in Python, you know, possibly in parallel. We're not going to run anything in parallel. Um, uh, libgl1, lib2lib, 0-0-1. Okay, so yeah, we already have all those things installed. Um, uh, I've already created the automatic directory, so let's go... That. So automatic in lowercase. So here I did the wget already, so I won't redo that in case it wipes anything. But here you can you can download this script directly from GitHub, um, which will install it. Um, then we're going to do uh, sudo chmod plus x um, to the web UI, which uh, makes it executable. And then we're going to run the web UI uh, with these parameters. So here we're not using a GPU, so we're going to skip the CUDA test because we're not going to be using um, CUDA uh, torches, PyTorch, um, precision full. I don't know what that means. Uh, no half is so GPUs can do um, non-full integer precision, which is a way of going faster, but we can't do that because we're using a CPU. Uh, Listen will run a web framework, and we're going to ask it to use a CPU, and we'll give it all the CPUs in our system. Um, so I think. I actually have that in my history. Here we go. So uh, here we go. Uh, skip torch CUDA test, no half listen. Here we go. Um, now, this is using the stable diffusion uh, v1.5, uh, which I downloaded uh, beforehand. If you just keyed all this into your terminal, um, then um, and yeah, it's looking for the transformers xformers uh, library, which I don't have installed. Um, it'll work fine for what we need uh, without that. Um, there are lots and lots of modules and plugins that you can get and you can add to this. Um, uh, as you will see, there's lots of boxes for them, right? So that is now uh, should be up and running. Um, let's refresh this. And ta da. Uh, here we have our uh, automatic uh, 1111 uh, web interface uh, for stable diffusion uh, v1.5. Um, let's let's go. So um, a fluffy dog. Um, we don't want horses. Um, and we just hit generate. And if we go back here. So now you can see that we're using um, five gig uh, of RAM. Maybe you could you could get away with this. So if you have an eight gig uh, PC, um, and it's using all our cores uh, again to um, more or less maximum. And here, uh, very soon, we should start seeing uh, an image of a fluffy dog. So okay, it says it's going to take eight minutes. It's usually a bit faster than this um, when it actually uh, gets going. And we can probably also see, yeah, so total progress, we have a, uh, a progress counter in here. Six minutes. Um, 
this is making an image which is 512 by 512. If we scale it down, so if we ask for a 256 by 256, uh, then it will run obviously um, more than four times quicker. Um, but it's also beating its own estimate. Excuse me. So uh, if you want your results faster, feel free to uh, lower the resolution. Um, for the demo today, please don't increase the resolution because, of course, if you're going to increase it, it's going to take eight times longer um, or more. Um, let's let this run in the background and um, we will continue with um, this for another couple of slides. So here are all of our different frameworks. Um, some LLMs. So depending upon how into this you are, you may already have heard of um, Probably everyone in the Western world has heard of ChatGPT by now. Uh, Llama, which is the Meta, uh, next Facebook equivalent. Uh, Vicuna, uh, which is from uh, LM Systems, the one we use today. It's fully open source. Um, Alpaca is another prominent model. Uh, Mistral is a European model. Uh, and I have to say, between Claude, Lambda, Gemini, I think at least two of them come from Google, uh, possibly even all three. Um, and Stable LM comes from a Stability AI who makes Stable Diffusion. So they're more famous for um, their image models rather than their text models, but they do both at the moment. So we used uh, Vicuna. Um, and not all of these are actually models in their own right. So um, some of them are fine tunings of other models. And the Alpaca model is actually a fine tuning uh, of Llama with some input from queries that they fed into ChatGPT. So they did kind of, they took the, the data set from Llama and then they fine tuned it with some questions and responses that they got out of ChatGPT uh, as what's called a LoRa, um, which we'll look at later. As of right now, there are already um, hundreds, if not thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, LLM models. Um, and this is the leaderboard um, as of a couple of days ago from the Hugging Face uh, repository. Um, I have, you can see there's an alpaca in there. Um, that's basically the only one um, that I recognize. Um, these benchmarks are, of course, synthetic. So, you know, it's it's a test and it's it's not necessarily reflective of how these are to use. Um, and obviously most people are using ChatGPT. Most people are not using um, the multiverse MTS air, whatever that is. Um, Basically, kind of, you know, this, this is a rabbit hole, and you can go down finding the best, most efficient one. Um, for our purposes, it's not that important unless you're an AI researcher or you're uh, running an AI company. You probably don't need to worry too much about that. Um, let's see how we're doing with our image. Oh, okay, it's nearly there. So here is our fluffy dog. So, this, as I mentioned, it's um, there is feedback in the model. So what we can see here is effectively an early draft of the output, which is fed back in um, and then re kind of reprocessed and chewed. And there we go. So you can see that that model was refined um, for our fluffy dog. Um, and it is not a horse. Um, so of course, the idea of the prompt and the negative prompt, um, you can think of these as, as two matrices. Um, you know, One has a positive weighting, one has a negative weighting. In terms of navigating this latent space to find you know, the cluster of images that you want. And the more specific uh, you can, can be with that, the better. The other thing I, think I skipped over it was that this, this is structured with um, tags on images. So you know they take, like, for example, uh, stable diffusion stability AI got into trouble using the Getty images. And in the earliest versions, um, occasionally you would get a Getty watermark reproduced as part of your image because that's where it all came from, because Getty have a large database that you can search, and they just dumped it all uh, in. Uh, again, you can do face generation, and a lot of that is uh, scraped from the web. Uh, people are trying to clean up their act now a little bit and have kind of authorized data sources that they've actually licensed. Um, but even some of the large open image sets um, that we use to, to construct things, and they're, they're still around. They haven't magically disappeared. So it's entirely possible that you know, a picture of you may be in one of these data sets, and uh, you're probably not going to come out in your entirety in someone's uh, diffusion model, but you know, your nose might be reproduced on somebody else's face, uh, or possibly a dog or a dragon uh, or a robot. Uh, it's uh, all part of the magic. So now I'm going to open this up uh, to you. I'll put this in the chat. 
Um, feel free, everyone, um, to uh, make your requests um, either in full resolution 512, 512, um, or in uh, 256 by 256, um, depending on your patience. And there we go. Someone's already submitted something or someone's logging on. Um, there we go. Um, is that working? I seeing the invalid requests. You might want to reload if you're not. Um, Um, I'm just seeing the question from uh, Namole for the uh, metrics used for the evaluation. Um, it's a good question. It's um, uh, to be honest, I don't I don't know. Um, it's things like um, giving it a block of text as an input and looking for uh, specific outputs, um, and then scoring those outputs also probably using um, GPT models. Um, uh, so it's at the moment there's it's a lot about gaming the metrics um, rather than actually kind of pushing the front. I mean, like all these things, as soon as you um, put numbers on it, um, rather than the kind of the wow experience. Um, on the right hand side down here, by the way, you can see um, it uh, or um, eleven point seven seconds per iteration. So this is per cycle of the model. Um, uh, this is very slow, um, and how many is going to do what? Twenty iterations at eleven seconds a piece. Um, if we had a GPU, this would be much faster. Uh, some people talk about tokens per second as the rate at which they can run models for the outputs. Um, if you've got a GPU, you can be in the token per second race. Uh, here, we are not in the token per second race, uh, but it will still work fine. So let's go back to our slides. Um, how to make a model uh, work for you? So you may already have heard in the in the press and people talk about, oh, people are going to make a new model and it's going to cost uh, millions of dollars to train. Um, training is expensive. Um, so training is the, the process of taking your training data and turning it into a model, effectively putting the weights in. Training is the most expensive activity you, if you build something from scratch. Um, for the inputs, so you need humans to write the code and supervise the computers, et cetera. You need training data sets. So the very early models were built you know, with just one training set. Um, and now people are using uh, multiple sets. Uh, a very popular set kind of publisher is called uh, Lion, L-I-A-O-N, I think, or L-I-O-A-N. Um, so it's just a massive you know, multi-gigabyte um, or even terabyte data set of images, which are tagged, that you can use um, for uh, feeding into your computer model to train it. So you can make this nice latent space with good classifications, and then you can build a good model that draws pictures. Um, you need GPUs. So again, there's a lot of talk about kind of the war for GPUs between uh, all the big tech companies, the GPU shortage. Um, we can run inference uh, here on a desktop class computer effectively, but uh, to do training, you need to have GPUs um, and time. So people also talk about how long it takes to, to train a, a base model and even using massive GPU clusters, it's typically measured in weeks or months. Um, so this is a this is a very serious process. Um, let's think of kind of training as a swimming pool. Um, you know, there's the shallow end, which we'll look at later, as the deep end, and building a model from scratch is effectively filling the whole pool. Uh, and if anyone's ever tried to fill a swimming pool, you know that it's not something you do overnight. Um, the swimming pools are very big. So to build um, GPT three. There are no public domain figures, but the estimates are that it costs them about $4 million in basically compute time. I don't think the, the staff wages are covered in this. To build GPT-4, which is the you know the, the breakthrough one that I think everyone's been using it, and I've, I've had to play with it too, costs 63 million. So there's an exponential scale there. And it's also an exponential increase in what it can do. Um, probably you're not gonna be building your own model, um, but maybe there's an option for you to kind of go in at the shallow end and do some fine tuning. So we can fine tune existing models uh, to a greater or lesser extent. Um, this is why open source is, is so useful. Um, one of the big breakthroughs that kind of happened, um, I guess it was last year, um, was that uh, someone leaked and made a torrent out of the weights from the Facebook um, Llama um, model. And that you know, got out on the internet and then all of a sudden everyone was playing with it, and also everyone was modifying it to do different things. Um, 
which is kind of, for me, that's the explanation of why open source is so important in AI, because you know these models are huge to build. But when you've built it, you can do all kinds of fun stuff um, fine tuning it. So there are several different ways in which you can fine tune a model. I'm gonna give you a very brief overview uh, of them. Um, so this is kind of putting the finishing touches on a, on a completing mo model. So low ra is, I would say, the predominant method used today. It stands for low rank uh, adaptation. It's e effectively interposing a, a matrix of, of weightings, so not actually a, a neural network, but just a, a set of weightings that change the attention um, on the training data. Um, there's also Dream Booth, which is basically a, a version of LoRa. Uh, it just goes by the name Dream Booth. I think it was invented by some people at Google. There's a technique called textual inversion. And here, what we're doing is we're not choosing the touching the model at all. We're just going to change the input. So you know, we take our text and we turn that into tokens and we basically have an input matrix. We're going to multiply something by our input matrix um, to change the input, and that's going to give us different outputs. And this is really cool. Um, and it's you get very impressive results by basically leveraging other bits of the latent space that you kind of were not maybe accessing before by changing the way your input works. Um, hyper networks. Uh, this sounds like it should be very effective, but in practice, it's not. Low rars are um, much more used. So hyper networks are where you would add an additional layer of neural network um, on top of the, the fine tuned weights to kind of redirect things and to try and get out more of what you want. Um, if you want to do any fine tuning, any um, kind of retraining, you are going to need a GPU. Um, so we will not be doing any of this uh, today. Um, uh, it takes hours. Um, so uh, this is some uh, kind of illustrations uh, that I got from um, Reddit. And there's also a YouTube video that's linked with these illustrations um, in the notes. Um, so Dream Booth, effectively, you're taking um, a specific input output set and you're doing a gradient update. So you're changing the, the weights in your diffusion model a little. Um, for uh, low RAR, um, you effectively end up with a file of additional weights that kind of gets put on top of your uh, diffusion model um, and can really change uh, the output. Um, hyper networks, you can see the little box there, which is represents your hyper network neural network that you've added. Uh, again, that you need to train. So you're you train that neural network as part of your retraining process to customize the output. And then this textual inversion, you can just see this other little column here. So that is your um, matrix that you create with your uh, changes to the input uh, that gives you, uh, orients your output to what you want. Um, an example of one of these that I found was, um, I think it was an 80s horror um, text inversion for stable diffusion. So basically, it, uh, they, they managed to pull out all of the 80s horror images um, from kind of horror movie posters and stuff like that that were within the, the data set. So if you typed in, you know, um, a girl standing in a field, you wouldn't just get a picture of a girl standing in a field. You would get an 80s horror uh, movie poster type um, image. Um, and the, hype, the, the textual inversion uh, file was, you know, uh, a few megabytes. Uh, typically for low RAS, you're looking at a few hundred megabytes. Um, and Dream Booth, so G Dream Booth acts on the whole diffusion model. So there you're looking at uh, gigabytes. Uh, Hyper networks is kind of also in the hundreds of megabytes uh, type scale. But really, low RAR is kind of low RAR and textual inversions of what community is, is doing. So I mentioned the um, Alpaca. So Alpaca, they took this low RAR technique and they applied it to the Llama model from Facebook. Um, it took uh, three hours on eight uh, 80 gig RAM uh, A100 NVIDIA cards, which apparently cost them less than $100. I think that's the today price. I think it actually cost them nearer $1,000 a year ago. Uh, and they made effectively a new model. Um, this is what kind of uh, is inside that model. So they took some um, open AI um, tasks. So uh, basically prompt and output made that into a, a data set. Um, they then low ra that on top of um, uh, the Llama data set in supervised fine tuning. And they made this model called Alpaca, which outperformed uh, the original Llama model on basically every benchmark, which was kind of also a, um, a standout moment in the very 
recent history of AI in that you know Meta had a team of um, hundreds, and I think this was uh, four or five people from uh, Stanford. I think there's a link uh, to this in uh, the notes. Uh, if not, I will add one to this. So fine tuning is incredibly powerful. Um, you can really leverage uh, data. Um, if you have a fancy GPU, um, so I have a 4090, which we're not using today, um, you can actually replicate this, uh, and I did. Um, so it took me about 23 hours, and I took the, you can get the data sets, and you can get the original Llama model, and you can build yourself a LoRa that makes you an alpaca. Um, and when you've done it, it's identical to the model which you could just download off the internet. <laughs> but I did it, and you know, that's that my one foray into training so far. Um, what could you use this for um, practically? So we take our open source model weights. Um, as I mentioned, uh, everyone claims to have an open source model. Um, if you read the terms and conditions, they're not all open source. Um, the Llama model from Facebook is particularly interesting and you can basically use it for whatever you want so long as it's not commercial. And as soon as it's commercial, then uh, it's not really open source anymore. You need to pay um, uh, royalties to um, Meta. Uh, many of the other models in the space are also not really open source. They're kind of uh, open on the outside. It's like OpenAI. Um, it's called OpenAI, but the GPT-4 is, um, or ChatGPT, is basically fully closed. So um, your mileage may vary with that. We take our own data source. So this could be um, pictures of our face labeled with you know, your name or pictures of your dog or um, text that you have written, um, manuals from your company, um, you put the two together and you can do um, low RAR. So you're going to need some time. Okay, it's not going to take months or weeks. It's going to take hours. You need some hardware. You could use your own. You could rent some, um, which cost you money. Um, and you can make your effectively your own special version of a model, um, which might be really good at um, answering questions on um, the entire document knowledge base of your organization. Um, so you know, at CERN, we could feed EDMS into one of these things. Goodness knows what the, the outcome would be, but at least it would have all the information there. You could read it uh, instruction manuals um, for all of your products. And there you go. There's a, an expert help bot that could help people, bearing in mind that it's not always going to give you the right answer, and it's not always going to give you the same answer. Um, or we could make a diffusion model um, that is very good at drawing particular things. So our face, um, our pets, um, certain celebrities. Um, and of course, uh, this is where the whole deep fake thing um, uh, comes into play. It's very easy, um, as we've shown in this is the fundamental piece. You need the training on top. And then instead of generating pictures of a floppy dog, we could be doing um, uh, deep fake celebrity pictures or uh, politicians or you know, uh, whatever you can imagine. So, wow, it's a really powerful uh, technology. Um, let's just see how we're doing with our models. So, yeah, it's running away. It's done at least one so far. Um, so I will leave this running, by the way, after the um, session is finished um, all night. So feel free to uh, to play with this um, if you haven't got it running on your own um, machines. Um, the nice thing is that, of course, if our model is open source, then we can legitimately share our uh, specialized model, our, our low raw layer, um, with anyone, um, which makes it really, really powerful. Uh, there are a few websites that have already sprung up, which are kind of sharing places for people to share their own low RARs that you can plug into the stable diffusion model we're using right now, or other stable diffusion models, or other um, image generation um, to do, you know, exactly that and to, to tweak things. Um, again, this. Um, can lead into uh, dubious things um, pretty easily, unfortunately. Um, it's uh, These models all tend to be really good at uh, the, the diffusion ones of drawing pictures of Emma Watson. Um, one of the interesting things you can do if you want to generate faces, for example, you can give it two celebrities and you can say like 50% um, Emma Watson and 50% Scarlett Johansson, and it will draw your woman's face that it merges the two latent space characteristics of the two. Um, which is one way people come up with consistent uh, images of people who don't really exist, but also who you know have good quality data. Um, yeah, it's um, it's kind of the the wild west at the moment. Um, so uh, this is the demo which we uh, are already 
uh, nearly uh, through. So I'll leave the server running um, after we're done. Um, I'll probably turn it off tomorrow morning. Uh, so feel free to um, play around with it um, and generate images and mess around with the prompts. Uh, please just make sure you keep your um, image resolution and kind of uh, number of steps down to uh, 5, 12, and 20. Otherwise, um, you'll need to stay up all night too to, uh, to get your stuff. Um, so that's all of the content I have prepared for today. Um, uh, some conclusions. So AI, I, hopefully I've presented to you and kind of demonstrated you how to get the state of the art um, of current AI up and running um, at home for uh, a few hundred uh, units of money. Um, the biggest things to really come out of AI so far are LLMs and these diffusion models, uh, text and, and vision. The, the next thing is you know, maybe video. Well, there are already video models. Um, and all of this, uh, LLMs and diffusion models, are based on transformers. Couldn't get away without an Optimus Prime. Um, and diffusion models. So again, as a reminder, if you imagine taking a drop of ink and putting it into a tank of water, you can see that it ripples out. With diffusion models, we're effectively uh, using a neural network to re-engineer this process and go back to the droplet, going back to our original image from noise, um, and doing this in a latent space where we have tags of knowing you know, what does a dog look like? It looks like this area of the latent space. What does a horse look like? It looks like this other area of the latent space. Um, and so we can make uh, horses or dogs or dog horses, um, depending on what we ask for. The fundamentals that underlie all this, so neural networks, that paper from the 40s, um, vector multiplication, it's kind of what makes it all go, and ultimately having a big computer um, and a vector processor, uh, so a GPU, um, or you could do it with a, a Xeon with an AVX instruction set, um, but GPUs are preferred. You can do inference. So what we're doing here is called inference, where we're basically just running a model, we give it a prompt, we get an output. And that you can do on a CPU, um, fine. It's not the fastest thing in the world, but it works. If you want to get more advanced, you need um, some GPU um, of uh, various uh, orders of magnitude, uh, more uh, power and uh, speed. What does the evolution of AI look like right now? Um, it's an exponential um, wow factor in time. Um, and of course, you know, you are here and it's only going to get more wow and more exciting. Um, and of course, the exponential curve looks the same wherever you are. Uh, on the exponential curve. It's always increasing at ever faster rates. So yeah, we're in the era of exponential growth for uh, AI models. Uh, who knows what the next kind of big thing uh, to come out uh, will be. Um, I have no idea, but I'm sure it'll be uh, exciting and fun to play with. So that's all the content I have. Um, does anyone have any questions?